Well, let's see here. I have at least a computer telling me I am live. So as always, if that is indeed the case, if the computer is telling the truth, go ahead and just leave that down in the live chat and say, yep, it's live. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can see you. Awesome. Audio and video are good. Now you may be wondering why the empty chair? Well, Joanna is on her way and she's going to be here for the second part of the live stream. So I figured we can go over all of the introductory stuff and talk a little bit about the science of algae. And then she will come in a little bit later when we're doing all the Q&A and everything because she's got all kinds of stuff going on in the fish room that she's trying to finish up. And so that is why you see this empty chair here. It's not just for show, right? Because that would be a silly thing to have for show. Now, I did also want to mention, as always, the background there uh, is Joanna did that for tonight because she decided that she wanted to celebrate algae. And in doing so, she made the lights green on the tree. So we have to fix that. We're going to talk about that today. So we're going to be talking about algae today. That is why you're here. That's what I said we are going to discuss and we are going to look at this from a somewhat scientific perspective, but I'm going to try not to bore you with all of this science. But we're going to do enough science, enough biology, so that we can better understand why algae shows up in an aquarium and how to deal with it later. And so we're going to look at the different types of algae. We are going to be looking at what they need in order to grow both in nature and then kind of relate that back to what happens in an aquarium and how we can control it and how we can deal with that. Before we get into all the algae discussion, just a few announcements as always. Uh, thing number one is Joanna's video came out this morning on the small scape. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I thought it was pretty cool. She went over pretty much like not every plant, but almost every plant, at least in our area, that Pet Smart sells and talked about them and looked at both the good and the bad, the advantages and disadvantages of buying plants, live aquatic plants from Pet Smart. So if you haven't checked that out, it's definitely worth a watch. Uh, it was it was a lot of information. Like I said, I like I'm not usually sitting there when she's filming and going over the stuff. So it's always kind of a learning thing for me because she's more into the plants and the aquascaping than I am. So it's kind of cool just to get that perspective. Uh, the second thing is uh, coming up on Friday, we have Fish Room Tour Part 2. I think you're going to enjoy it. And so in the part one that I showed last Friday, we went over that side, what I call the lighter side of the fish room. We call it the sink side in, in our home because we just have to talk about, okay, which side of the fish room are we, you know, if I need something from one side, we have to be able to identify it. So we've got the couch side and the sink side. And so we're going to be looking at the couch side on Friday. And so we'll look at some fish that I've gotten. And one of those fish in that video is a, it's a bucket list fish that I, we didn't talk about in the video where we did the bucket list fish of 2021 because I already had them, but it was something I've been wanting for a long time. I saw them over a year ago. They're young and so they're not showing their full color, color yet, but I think they're gonna be pretty awesome. So that's kind of what we've got going on for this week. All right, so algae. Let's just get right into it. I wanted to talk about algae because uh, some people have problems with algae. It's one of the questions that we get asked quite a bit. And that is, I've got some algae. How do I control it? How do I get rid of it? How do we avoid algae? There's another side to this conversation that we're going to be dealing with. And that is, do we need to stress about algae as much as some of us do? And for some of us, I know what it's like. You see a little bit of algae in the tank, especially if you've got a planted tank and you're thinking, oh boy, I really don't want this stuff in my tank. And maybe you get like a little bit of a heart flutter and the little bit of fish room sweats starts to drip off of your forehead. And you're wondering, is this going to immediately take over my tank and ruin my entire aquascape? Am I going to have to tear it all up and start over again? And so the point tonight is to talk about this, this process and how algae winds up in your tank and what we can do about it. So as some of us may already know, algae is a single or multicellular eukaryotic organism. Is this starting to feel like biology class yet? So what that means, all right, single or multicellular, you can have anything from just individual cells, a lot of your green algae looks like that, all the way to the big brown algae that you would see in the ocean. So at least morphologically, anatomy, from an anatomy perspective, it's pretty diverse. 
So eukaryotic, single or multi-celled eukaryotic, there are two main classifications of cells, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are like your bacteria, right? They lack a nucleus. They don't have like little compartments inside the cells called organelles where the eukaryotes, like algae, like us, we do. We've got nucleus inside of our cell. We have a nuclei inside of each one of our cells for the most part. And we have these things called organelles. So maybe some of you from biology class remember these things like mitochondria, smooth and rough ER, and the Golgi apparatus, and lysosomes and peroxisomes. If you remember none of that, it's okay. You won't need to know that to understand how we control algae. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of background because what that means is the algae in your tank, at least from a cellular perspective, is much more similar to the cells in your fish than let's say bacteria in fish, All right? So the algae is more similar to the, the cells in fish than they are even to bacteria. And so that helps us try to, we have to understand that when we start maybe throwing different types of chemicals in a fish tank, understanding that all chemicals are toxic at certain concentrations. I don't care if we're talking about antifungals, antibiotics, anti, you know, the algicides, they're all going to be detrimental to fish, some at lower concentration than others. But when it comes to the chemicals that we use to fight algae, if that's the way, the direction we're going to go, we need to understand that those chemicals are interacting with a, a, an organism where the cell structure is a little bit more similar to the fish. All right, then maybe like if we were throwing antibiotics in a tank and trying to fight bacteria. More on that a little bit later. Now, there are different types of algae, and some of you have experienced one or more of these. You've got the greens, and with those greens, you'll get like the, the green that the green algae is kind of soft and it's easy to scrape off. You get the, the hard green algae, and that's a real pain. So, you get that on the glass sometimes, like this stuff is like little pasted cement all over everything, and it's not coming off, and nothing seems to eat it. And then you've got the green hair algae, and that looks somewhat unsightly. The other ones you can kind of get around. It's like, all right, that's not the end of the world. But that green hair algae, once it starts to establish itself and it's kind of string, you know, it's kind of flowing from the plants and everything, that can be more of a pain. And then you've got the brown algae, more like the, a lot of people call it the diatom algae. And again, that's relatively easy to, to physically scrape off of stuff, although. Unlike the stuff we've talked about so far, a lot of times that brown algae tends to grow the fastest. And a lot of times people with newer tanks tend to get that first and it spreads everywhere and it causes people a lot of headaches early on. And then of course, you've got this, what we have in our fish room in some of our tanks, and this is an algae I actually kind of enjoy, and that is the red spot algae. And so this red spot algae is probably the slowest growing algae that we have in our fish room. And it, it pops up on the sides of glass and on some rocks. And that's really about it, maybe on the gravel periodically. And then we have the horrible one. The one that everybody fears, especially when you've got a planted tank. And that is the one and only black beard algae, right? That's the one where you see that. And if you've got a planted tank, a lot of people freak out about it because it's like, Oh man, I've heard that snails won't eat it and shrimp won't eat it and fish don't eat it and it's going to spread and it's going to overtake my tank and it's going to be a huge problem. And so we're going to talk about the differences and how we deal with those different types of algae as we go through tonight. But those for the most part, those are the types of algae that most fish keepers are going to be dealing with on the freshwater side of things. What we have to understand is it gets there in a number of different ways. And for the most part, it's almost impossible to avoid having algae enter the fish tank, entering that ecosystem, right? There are lots of things you can do to control it once it gets there, but it's really difficult to prevent it altogether from at least getting into the tank. And the reason for that is it comes with wood. It can sneak into tanks with rocks. It can, dis it can sneak into tanks when you introduce fish and a little bit of that fish water winds up in your tank from another tank. It can certainly get in with plants. Some algae produces spores. And so now you've got that, that aspect to worry about where the spores are much, much more hardy outside of water. And so you've got all these different ways that algae can get into a tank. Now, we have to understand when it comes to algae, there are a couple things that it absolutely positively requires. One, light. 
So we're going to talk about the importance of light and how we deal with light to control what's going on in your tank. So it needs light. Algae is photosynthetic and it needs nutrients. Now, when I talk about algae in some of my biology classes, a lot of students tend to think, even when it comes to plants, that the plants take nutrients out of the soil and that's how they get so big. The algae takes the nutrients out of the water and that's how it grows. Yes, both plants and algae, they need things like nitrates or some type of nitrogen compound. That could be ammonia, nitrite, nitrate. They need phosphates. They need sulfates. They need micronutrients like iron. Uh, they need um, calcium. And so they need all those things. But that is not the, the thing, the thing that contributes to their mass. What contributes to their mass is CO2. Think about it for a second. If you had a plant, a little tiny plant in your house, and you put it in a pot, and that plant gets really big, let's say it grows six feet tall, the dirt in that little pot didn't go down, right? It's not, not noticeably. Where did the plant get all of that mass? It came from the air. It came from the CO2 in the atmosphere. That to me is mind blowing. And when you really think about it, all the trees and the bushes and the grasses and all the things that live in the sea, the carbon that they need to actually create the mass that you see comes from a gas, it comes from CO2, and that's absolutely mind blowing. And so while it needs all these other nutrients, the, the vast majority of the bulk of the organism that you see was actually built from the CO2 gases, either in the water in the case of algae, or in the air in case of land plants. And that's just a really cool thing. And it always just absolutely blows my mind. Now, in order to understand what's going on in our aquarium, we should try to understand what's happening with algae in nature. And this is something we talk a lot about in my microbiology class. In nature, you've got, in most aquatic environments, whether we're dealing with the ocean or most freshwater environments, there's a couple different ways that you can describe the nutrient concentrations in water. I'm going to throw some science words at you. All right, so are we ready? All right, that was, sorry if that really, you know, annoys people, the knuckle cracking. There's a couple different ways that we can look at water. One is called oligotrophic. I know it's a big word. If I had a whiteboard here, I'd spell it out for you. But oligotrophic waters basically means this is water that is generally nutrient poor. In other words, the nitrates, the sulfates, the phosphates, the things that we would normally call fertilizer for land plants, that stuff is lacking in most aquatic environments. What algae and photosynthetic organisms normally have in an aquatic environment is a lot of light in most cases. And so while they have a lot of light, what's preventing them from growing out of control and taking over an environment is the fact that the nutrient con concentrations are relatively low. In fact, one of the things that we talk about in microbiology is like here in the United States, we put a lot of fertilizers in the soil in the Midwest throughout the spring and the summer. And what winds up happening is we get a lot of rain and then some of those nutrients end up washing out of the soil and into local rivers and streams and then finally into the Mississippi River and it goes into the Gulf of Mexico. What happens there is we take water that is oligotrophic, nutrient poor, that has a lot of sunlight, so the only thing that was controlling algae growth was the fact that they didn't have enough nutrients to grow out of control, but we've added them by doing all the fertilization and then later on, that winds up in the Gulf of Mexico and that water goes from oligotrophic, nutrient poor, to heterotrophic, nutrient rich. And then you get this massive algae bloom and then you get organisms eating the algae and eventually those organisms consume a bunch of oxygen and we get these things called dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and it can be really, really bad. They can measure thousands of square miles. I say all that because when we are dealing with an ecosystem, a fish tank, we are the ones in control of all of those things. We control the amount of light that is going into the tank, the duration and the intensity. We also control the amount of nutrients that are left in the water column. And so when we can dial those two things in, we have an opportunity to opportunity to control that ecosystem and make it healthy and also make it wonderful to look at. Thank you so much, Clint, for the super chat. Appreciate it. I'm glad <laughs> learning stuff fun. Thank you so much. So when it comes to understanding that with nature, now let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about, okay, now what 
what do we do, right? If we know all this stuff, that's great. But if we can't apply it, what difference does it make? First thing that we have to understand, and this is important. Are you ready? Here's the important thing. Algae is not bad. All right. I know it can be unsightly. I know that at times we can look at a tank and be like, you see that stuff? It's ugly. If you look at the thumbnail of this video, if the, of the live stream, if you go back and look at it, you know what that is? That is actually one of the sides of our 75-gallon gymnogeophagus tank. And I just went up and I took a picture of that. Now, we keep the front pane algae free, but we let it grow everywhere else. All right, so on the sides of that tank, there's al algae growth. On the backs of some of our tanks, there's algae growth. Algae is not a bad thing. It's part of an ecosystem. And in nature, it's part of a healthy ecosystem. So to think of, just think about this before you go and rip all your stuff away and, and try to make a tank that's completely algae-free. One, it, it provides food. And so there are fish out there that we're going to talk about later that will eat it. But a lot of times, what you'll see in our fish room, and you saw this a little bit in the part one fish room tour, you're going to see a little bit more of it in part two on Friday. There are some tanks that are set aside for breeding. I like algae growth in those tanks. In fact, in one of the, I think it was one of the members only videos that we did, I showed members the uh, multi tank, the 40 gallon multi tank. And there was some green hair algae that I allowed to grow on one side of that tank. And what I showed was all of the little tiny multi fry, those little tiny shell dwellers are so small and they're picking. They're not eating the green hair algae, but they're eating microorganisms that are on that surface of that green hair algae or they're eating organisms that are eating the microorganisms on that green hair algae. We get a lot of questions about, hey, can I get rid of the algae that are on the shells, the actual shells for my shell dweller tank? Yeah, you can do that, but don't. And the reason for that is eventually that algae will often house microbes that the very, very tiny fry can eat. And so it's, it's an incredibly important thing, especially if you're breeding fish, don't get rid of the algae. The second thing is the algae is helping bring down nitrogen concentrations, whether that's ammonia, whether that's nitrite or nitrate. And so that algae is performing an ecological process. Now, again, there are other ways to do that that don't look, well, like algae. But still, it does provide a benefit. All right. Uh, James, thank you so much for the super chat. This whole channel is a blessing. There is so much to learn, and this channel has taught me so much. Thanks for all the hard work you guys put in. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for the super chat. Okay, so now that we kind of have that down, that algae is not bad, all right, how do we get rid of it? Well, there's one way, and I want to address that right from the start in a way that I think can be potentially dangerous to your fish and doesn't actually solve the problem, and that is we can add chemicals to a fish tank that actually kills the algae. So an algicide. You know, I know like we're sponsored by Fritz Aquatics and they actually have a type of algicide. Uh, it's, it's Fritz Algae Cleanout, I think it's called. And that stuff works. I mean, if you put that in a tank, it's probably going to kill a lot of the algae. But it's going to come back if you haven't addressed the root cause. And so that root cause can be a number of things. And we're going to talk about those things. We're also going to talk about ways that might make things a little bit easier. Now, other things. Light. And so let me give you an example. In our fish room, in almost every one of our tanks, we have our lights on for about nine hours a day. They run roughly three hours in the morning and they run six hours at night. Two things can happen with light. Thing number one is you can have the lights on too long. And so even if you've got a planted tank, there's excess light there. And remember what we said, there are two limiting factors when algae is growing. One is the light, both the intensity and the duration, and two are the nutrients. And so if you've got light on that's too long, that can provide extra energy for algae growth. But the other thing and something that I don't know if we think about a lot, and that is the intensity. I am a big believer that in most aquatic environments that we set up, we often have more light in those tanks than what you would normally find in nature. We want it nice and bright. We want to see our fish. We want our fish to look cool. But in a lot of freshwater environments especially, there's two things going on. One, our water tends to be a lot more clear, has less turbidity than a lot of places in nature. 
and two, we've got fairly intensive light on top of our tank. And so when you combine those two things, especially the water clarity perspective, you have the potential there to get more algae growth. Now, again, for us, nine hours a day seems to work out fairly well. It is something that you have to dial in for your tank. The thing that you have to be careful of, especially if you have a planted tank, and that is resist the urge to shut the lights off completely. We're gonna talk about plants in a second, but your plants are competing with algae. And so if you shut the lights off too long, you keep them off too long, you turn them down too far, all of a sudden now your plants are not getting what they need. And not only that, now the algae may take the upper hand because now the plants are starting to die back and you've increased the nutrient levels in your tank. The second thing, and this again, when we're talking about environments in nature, we talked about the fact that most aquatic environments are oligotrophic. In other words, they're nutrient poor. This is something that I think a lot of us, if we get this dialed in, we can do a really good job of controlling algae growth. And that is making sure our fish tanks don't cross over from oligotrophic, nutrient poor, to heterotrophic, nutrient rich. And so therefore, our nitrates are in excess, our phosphates, our sulfates, and we're getting all these extra nutrients and now we've got this really wonderful area environment for algae to grow. And so this is a way that we can limit the amount of algae we get. Now, there's a number of ways that we can do this. One, we can use plants. In fact, we did a video on how, what plants we use to help control algae growth. Usually these plants are going to be fast growing. Usually they're going to be stem plants. So to control algae growth, you want to be able to pull nutrients out of the water. And so plants that we have used that work really well. Hornwort, the stuff grows really fast. The only problem you're going to have with hornwort is once it establishes itself and it really starts to grow, it grows fast. Like most fast growing plants, it will also die back very quickly if it doesn't get the nutrients it needs. And so hornwort is excellent. We have used guppy grass, which can grow relatively quickly. Uh, you can use the stem plants like water wisteria, water sprite, those are really good plants that tend to grow fast, but again, once they start to suck those nutrients out of the water, you have to make sure that you replace them. What's interesting is we have our 20 gallon Julichromus ornatus tank. And at first, that tank, when it finally started to establish itself, it started to get a bunch, a bunch of brown, uh, black beard algae all over the rocks. And I was like, oh man, and it was, getting, it was getting pretty bad, worse than most tanks of ours get. And I just take, I took a handful of hornwort and I chucked it in. And what happened over the next couple months was very interesting. The blackbeard algae completely died back. The hornwort went crazy. And then what was really interesting is after the blackbeard algae died, green hair algae started to take its place and compete a little bit better with the hornwort. So I thought that was a really interesting thing. So you can use plants. If you've got a tank where it's like, you know what, I can't put plants in there. I've got fish that will eat them then maybe you're looking at using something like pothos and you can put the roots maybe in a filter or you just float the roots and let the roots grow into the tank. We've done that a number of times and allow the pothos to compete with the algae. Is that going to get rid of it 100% completely? Probably not. And that's one of the things I want us to understand. No necessarily one of these things is going to eliminate algae 100% of the time, but when you use these things in combination, they tend to work pretty well. And so first thing, we're getting our lights dialed in. Now again, for us, it's nine hours split into two times a day. For you, you might find, hey, you know what? I've got some highlight plants. That's not gonna work for me, but we really wanna make sure that we get that dialed in. You know, we had an issue on Joanna's Nano wall where we had 72 inch beams work lights that were illuminating all of her nano tanks. The problem with that is her nano tanks weren't very deep. And so those 72 inch beams work lights blasting light into those tanks made algae control for her very difficult. We took those lights when we redid the nano wall last week and put them on some of our 125s. Guess what? Those tanks are much deeper, they're much wider, greater volume, and we're not having the problem on those tanks like we did in some of our nano tanks. We've thought about the plants, right? Maybe we're like, you know what, that's great, but again, I've got fish that eat the plants. Yeah, I'll try the pothos and I'll, I'll deal with the lights. If you don't have lights, then you, or if you don't have plants, then the light situation is much easier to play with, right? So the next thing, how do we control the nutrients in our tanks? The easiest way, of course, water changes, right? I've always 
been a big advocate is if we can keep nitrate nitrate concentrations to around 20 parts per million it can go a little bit higher if you've got a planted tank but if you're if you're around maxing out at around 20 parts per million you're probably going to be in good shape and it's going to help limit the amount of algae remember what i said algae is not a bad thing if you can control it i don't make any attempt to completely eliminate algae in any of our tanks and i think it shows when you look at our fish room tours but if I can keep the nitrate levels at around 20 parts per million and I've got lights on at a reasonable amount of time, I don't have algae that grows out of control. And that's really the fear, I think, for a lot of people. It's like, I've got this stuff. What's going to happen next? That's the scary part, right? Is, is it going to continue to grow? Is it going to kill my plants? Is it going to grow all over my decorations? Is it going to ruin my entire ecosystem? But if you control the light, you keep your nitrates down to 20 parts per million. And one of the ways we do that is water changes. Now, I will also say, if you don't have a planted tank, and I've talked about this before in ways to control algae, one of the videos I did, gravel vac. Get the fish waste, get the uneaten food, get that stuff out of the substrate, especially if you have gravel and you have no plants. Because all of that organic waste is breaking down and it's creating all of the nutrients that the bacteria, or sorry, that the algae need to grow. You're creating that heterotrophic type of environment. And so if you gravel vac and pull that waste out, you're, you tend to have less algae over time. So we're controlling the light. We're controlling it by using our water changes. Now, there are other things that you can do. And we can think about, okay, what about the organisms in my tank? Can they help? Absolutely. And so I think some of the main go-tos, you've got things like bristle nose plecos. Now for us, we have bristle nose plecos. And I would say if we've got 70 or 80 tanks up and running, 95% of our tanks have at least one bristle nose pleco in that tank. And for the most part, understand, we don't really scrape algae off of the glass. We allow the light, the water changes and controlling the nutrients and the animals in that ecosystem to do the work for us. And so the bristlenose plecos for us tend to do a relatively good job, especially if you're not just throwing tons and tons and tons of pellets down there for them to eat. Then they get full, they're like, yeah, I don't think I want to eat the algae anymore. There's a balance there, all right? So you want to have, you want to feed them because if your tank, if they go through and clear the algae off and then you don't feed them, they're going to die. And that's usually the problem that people have with algae eaters and bristlenose plecos is they think, Yep, they're just there. And otocinclus, yeah, they're just there to clean the algae and then it's going to be fine. Well, once they do that, now you got to feed them. All right, and so you have to find that balance. It might take some time. So bristlenose plecos are good. I just mentioned for smaller tanks, the otos uh, can be a, a, a good organism to help control algae. Is it going to completely eliminate it? Maybe not. Uh, snails, you know, we use mystery snails. I find the mystery snails do a fairly decent job, especially in smaller tanks where I really don't want to add a bristlenose pleco. And so... Is one mystery snail going to be able to keep your 10 gallon under control? Maybe not, but two or three of them could, right? And it's, it's interesting because a lot of people I know, they're scared. Well, I heard that snails eat plants. They can. If the plants are unhealthy, and yes, certain very thinly leaved plants, they might be able to do a little bit of damage. But one of the things, if you go back and look at our fish room tour part one that we just did on Friday, you will see a 20 gallon tank that is loaded with plants, Anubias and Crips and all kinds of stuff. And there are probably 50 or 70 mystery snails in that 20 gallon lawn. We call that the plant clean off. It's, it's a mystery snail breeding tank, but it's also the plant clean off tank. And so when Joanna's got algae, whether it's, it doesn't matter what kind of algae it is, she chucks it in that tank and all those mystery snails do their job and they clean the surfaces of those leaves. But guess what? We never lose plants in that tank. I cannot ever recall, at least with, Anubias, Crips, Jungle Val has been in that tank. Um, I'm trying to think, there's a couple others that we put in there and never lost any of those plants to the snails just eating them. So mystery snails absolutely can, can be a, a good addition. Shrimp, shrimp, especially if you've got the, the green hair algae. We had a problem in one of our 20 longs. I had put some variatus platys in there. And before that, I don't remember what was in there, but there was some green hair algae in there. I also put some shrimp culls in there. So they were just kind of brown. I'm like, I'd want to, I mean, I didn't want to just get rid of them. So I'm like, I'm going to put them in there and, and just see what they do. And sure enough, they cleaned off most of the green hair algae. And so that worked out really, really well. You've got the Siamese algae eaters that will sometimes 
nibble on blackbeard algae. And so that can be uh, an interesting addition. I have found Florida flagfish to be especially valuable with green hair algae. We had a 125 that was just covered in it. I put three, one, two, three Florida flagfish in there. And within about two to three weeks, I didn't see a single little strand of green hair algae. I'm actually going to pull those fish out. And their next stop is the 75 gallon Gymnogia Vegas tank. I'm going to let them clean off all that green hair algae. So they're really good little workers. With everything I'm talking about, you really have to make sure that the fish or the organisms that we're, we're looking at adding to the tank are going to fit with your ecosystem, right? They're going to fit with the organisms that are already in there. So just, you know, be careful with that. I have used sailfin mollies to clean off algae. Not all mollies, at least for us, like the reason why we have our 50 gallon low boy and there's all those, those black mollies in that tank is I thought, okay, you know what? Hopefully they'll go in there and clean off some of the green hair algae. I see them picking at it occasionally, but the sailfin mollies, at least for us, did a much better job of that. Uh, guppies. I have watched guppies take care of like more like the slimy, like the, the, the green algae that's not real hard. I've watched them polish off an entire, um, we had our little fake rock background. It was starting to get covered in green hair, uh, I'm sorry, uh, green algae, and they just took care of it. Within about a week, it was all gone. Uh, so there are organisms that you can add, right? You've got the Chinese algae eaters. Now I know they get a bad rap. One, they're aggressive, like, and you have to consider that again. Where are you putting these things? Don't put your Chinese algae eaters in with your angelfish, your discus, and your severums. That could be a problem. But I have used Chinese algae eaters in African cichlid tanks. And what I like about them, at least when they're young, is they do things that I don't think a bristlenose pleco does as well. And that what they'll do, especially if you've got like fake plants, they'll go over each leaf of a fake plant. They just seem to be more thorough as little youngsters. And I found as long as you don't overfeed the Chinese algae eaters, they continue to do an okay job even as adults eating algae. And they were really in our 150 gallon, our four foot 150, for a while, they were, there was like four of them in there. And that was pretty much the only organism in that tank that was eating algae, was the reason for the algae control. So they're not as good as some of the others, but they do work. Uh, African cichlids, especially the Malawi cichlids, will sometimes munch on algae that's covering, uh, that's covered rocks and things like that. Uh, I will sometimes take like uh, green hair algae and just throw it in our Mbuna tank and it goes missing. So I'm assuming they like it along with duckweed and frog bit they'll eat and hornwort. Uh, they seem to love all of it. Now, there are a couple other things you could do and then I'm gonna start taking your questions because I know I've rambled on longer than in this video than I have in a lot of the other ones. Uh, there are, there's media and chemicals that you can use that aren't algicides that may be helpful. And there's a couple of them that I wanna talk about and using these in combination, I have show and tell time now, a um, couple things that may help. I started using this, and again, Fritz, just to be clear, Fritz Aquatics is a channel sponsor, so I um, always want to make that clear, but they just came out with this stuff. It's called Fuzz Out, and basically what it is is it's a phosphate remover, right? It binds phosphate. The, this whole thing, let me open this up for you because it's a newer product, and I, I'm just trying it out. So I don't have long-term data or anything like that but it comes in this filter bag. And the idea is you just chuck this in your filter and this is good for 75 gallons. And actually I put one of these in a 125 and what I wanted to see is what would it do, hold on, what would this stuff do to black beard algae? Because I had a little bit in the 125 and it definitely was reduced. I've got less of it on my wood, less of it on my rocks. So binding phosphate, the nice thing is this is not something that is going to really harm your fish. Now, if you've got live plants, this might not be a great option for you because you're gonna be binding some of the stuff that the plants may utilize. But if you have a non-planted tank with algae issues, this could potentially help. The other thing is the Monster 360 that they sell. A lot of people ask, well, what is that for? This is heterotrophic bacteria that tends to eat uh, fish waste and so that waste is not deteriorating in the water column. And therefore, these microbes are gonna break it down. And essentially what you're doing is you're trading bacterial growth for algae growth. And so the microbes are going to eat the waste. They're going to grow in numbers, but it's not unsightly algae. Instead of the algae getting a hold of those nutrients, and then you've got kind of a problem. The last thing, and I think one of the most obvious things you can do, hold on, I've still got my show and tell here, elbow grease. You can just scrape the stuff off of glass. And I brought this here because there's a couple of things you can do, and it really depends on the type of algae that you have. So for instance, if you've got like the, that hard green algae that's on the glass, 
you want something that's going to have kind of a blade to it. Uh, I actually found this particular thing is not entirely useful. I would rather just use a razor blade with a handle uh, to scrape off that harder algae that gets on the glass, the hard green algae, or like the red spot algae that doesn't really come off with some of the, the, the softer stuff. Like you've got these things, you know, this is just an attachment that goes on here. And so this will usually get like the harder stuff off, but then maybe if you've got like the brown diatom algae or that softer green algae, this will work a little bit better. And so again, there is no one thing that I am doing where I can say, this one thing will completely eliminate all of your algae issues. It's a combination of all the things that we do in our fish. And again, if you watch our videos, you will see, yeah, there is some algae in the tanks, but it's not overgrowing the tanks. We don't make a big um, effort to scrape glass. I mean, we, we don't really use these things all that much. Um, and it's because of the combination of the lights the water changes, keeping our nitrates at around 20 parts per million. Having organisms in the tanks that will eat the algae. Now, let me explain something. The best time to add those organisms, like snails, like shrimp, like bristlenose pleckles, or whatever you choose to, to add, otos, I like to have them there before I need them. And then I feed them, right? So if I add bristlenose pleckles to a brand new tank, I know they don't have anything to eat in there inherently. There's no algae in there for them to really munch on right now, or maybe not even some biofilms because the tank is new. So yeah, I might be throwing in some algae wafers in there for them. And then as the tank establishes itself and as it finds that nice balance and algae starts to grow, they're already there because the last thing you want to do is have a big issue. And so I find that when you've got the snails or the bristlenose plecos there ahead of time, you don't have that hard green algae forming. You don't have as much of the blackbeard algae because they're constantly going over those surfaces before that stuff ever has a chance to really form. And so that's pretty much what we do. I just saw Joanna is making her way into the, the, the area, the arena. And so, yeah, that's, that's kind of our, our philosophy on controlling, controlling the algae. So we'd love to, let's go ahead, let's start looking at questions and see what we got here. Are you done with all the sciencey stuff? Yeah, by the way, welcome. Welcome, say hello to everybody. Hi everybody, happy Wednesday. Glad you're here. Uh, we went light science. We went oh. lighter on the science. And so, do you have anything you'd like to say about algae before I uh, get into the oh. questions? <laughs> yeah, you're not as big except, of a fan, right? No, not really. I know you kind of like the natural look. Me, not so much. Except if it's in very small amounts, like in the 15 tall, that's okay. The column tank, we got a little spot of algae. Uh, but other than that, no, I'm, I'm not a fan. Yep. Um, so WAF, small correction, autotroph, self-feeding. Yes, the, um, the autotrophs are self-feeding. Heterotrophs are going to use. So when you say self-feeding, what that really means, the difference between an autotroph and a an heterotroph. And so that wasn't, those weren't necessarily the words I was talking about. Oligotrophic and heterotrophic waters are um, something a little bit different. That's explaining the water, um, the, the nutrient concentrations in the water. Um, when we're talking about autotroph and heterotroph, we're now describing the way in which an organism obtains carbon. Um, photosynthetic organisms are often, not always, but often autotrophs in which, what that means is they're fixing CO2, they're taking CO2 out of the environment, and then they are making the organic materials that they need in order to grow. Where the heterotrophs like us human beings and fish, uh, we are eating the carbon from other living or once living things so that we can make sure that we have the, the macromolecules that we need in order to grow. Now here's an interesting thing. And something I think we're going to talk about more at some point in the future. The, the heterotrophs, the photo, or I'm sorry, the photoautotrophs, the organisms that photosynthesize, when you turn off the lights, they switch. The minute you turn off the lights, they start consuming oxygen and releasing CO2, and they start using the sugars that they have stored just like we would do. So it's kind of interesting. And that actually has some implications for aquatic environments. And I think we're going to put out a video about that in a very, very near future. So we've got some people saying hi. I'm, Michael, thank yeah. you so much for the super chat. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I earned at least one credit hour tonight. I think <laughs> you probably have two. So, you know, <laughs> I will uh, make sure to put that on your transcript. Uh, <laughs> um, Paiu says, leave algae on Mbuna tank or should I scrape it off? Uh, I generally don't worry about it. 
So unless it's on the front glass. So, so I want to be clear, I don't like algae on the front glass. I want to be able to see my fish. I want to be able to see the decorations. I want to be able to enjoy the tank. But if it's on the sides, if it's on the back of the glass, if it's on some of the decorations, I generally just leave it there and let the fish kind of do their thing. So I don't tend to worry about it. Let's see here. Yeah. Filigree Aquatics, can you do a more sciencey live stream with the whiteboard? That would be fun. Oh, you yeah. know, it's been... So I bought, I don't know if you've, if you've watched some of the older science -y videos I, I've done, I actually have a whiteboard with erasable marker. And the only reason why I bought that was I had done some videos, I think one was on pH and the other one was on the nitrogen cycle. Yeah. And I busted that out because you really do need the, the visual for that stuff. But yeah, I need to do some more whiteboard science videos Good and stuff. definitely, yeah, and, and do that. So, okay, what I, else do we have I saw here? a couple different names here. You did? I did. Okay. I'm, I'm catching up here. Sorry. All right. Hold on. Let's... Um, Duke City Aquariums oh. is here. Hey. What's up, man? And uh, Corey. Is Corey's Corey... here. Is Corey still here? I don't know. I was I was blabbing on, so I didn't really get a chance to look at the <laughs> chat. And, you know, if he's here, Corey, I'm not a pro like you, buddy. So I just ignored the chat he, until I get done. Uh, team. He's, uh, he, he was here for Team LG. Team so LG. See? Great Bro. minds think alike. Yeah, <laughs> team algae all the way. It's it's not bad stuff. I like it, uh, definitely. Okay, so let's see here. Ooh, in Australia, Ooh. Charlie Butterfly. Hmm. Have you done a live plant live yet? Have we done a live plant? Have we done planted tanks live? We did on your channel. We did aquascaping, mm -hmm. um, and then we did something else. I don't know if we've done one specifically for live plants, but we should. No. And at some point, that would probably be something that might wind up on her channel, The Smallscape. Because we do live streams, by the yeah. way, like a couple times a month. Usually they're on Sundays at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do things that are more aquascaping and nano tank related on, on her channel. So, Whips World, I'm back. Oh, uh -oh. Glad to back. see it. My betta, two and a half gallon bowl, has horrific green hair algae every week. I do weekly 100% water changes. I have a fair amount of pathos, no substrate, small co-op mm -hmm. sponge, Clip on light, why? I wonder, do you have any water flow in that tank? So I have found that sometimes that green hair algae tends to grow a little bit more when there is less water flow. And so sometimes something as simple as adding an air stone might help, it, it might not, but I found that it, it sometimes helps. Uh, Michael said, Joanna, I love the t-shirt with the chalk art and your handwritten note, I'm wearing it tonight while doing water changes and waiting for you guys Excellent. to start. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Glad Yay. you like it. Uh, thank you for the support. All right, Katie says, have been battling green hair and other algae for a few months. Finally got a phosphate test kit and it's high, even from the tap. Got phos phosgard and it's helping a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and, and I think, again, getting back to this stuff here, this fuzz out stuff. And again, it's new. Oh. It seems to be doing pretty well in the 125. And, and to be clear, I only used one of these bags. I, this thing is supposed to be for a 75 gallon. So I use like a half a dose. Um, I'm going to try it again because I, and I'm not gonna, I haven't done a full review on it yet. I don't know how it's going to work long term, but I'm probably going to throw a couple of these things in my hang on back filter and see what happens. But what's interesting about the fuzz out is that they chose to target phosphate. And I think that was very wise uh, because when you try to target nitrate, the concentrations are usually pretty high and it's, it's, it would be much harder to bind all that nitrate than it would be phosphate. So I think they chose the right target. Uh, again, the only issue is gonna be if you've got a, a heavily planted tank, that might not work, but it could. Uh, Nelson said, Hillstream loaches are great for algae. They are, yeah, absolutely. Um, they are great for algae. And that's one of the ones. And, and it's funny because I have like these biases towards fish I keep a lot of. And so the Hillstream loaches, we don't keep a lot of them. And therefore, sometimes I forget about them. But you're absolutely mm -hmm. correct. That's a good one. Thank you for catching that. It's a good one to add. Um, Sue Brown, first time here. Welcome. Hey, hey glad you're here. What's up? Oh, and then uh, I want to say, hey, Mary Page. Hey, Myrtle. Hey, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, awesome moderators. So the question, uh, I, saw, I just saw a question somewhere. Somebody asked, oh, uh, Kara, how long does the uh, the fuzz out last? I think, and it's, now it's dark in here and I don't have any glasses on, but I think this thing says, I thought I read like two, it needs to stay in the, in the filter compartment for two weeks and it's not rechargeable. So again, what we want to be doing is the other things in addition to the fuzz out. I consider that fuzz out like, okay, I've, I've got an existing problem. I'm going to fix my water changes. I'm going to fix the light situation. I might be adding some organisms that will help me 
but this will also help me just get the stuff kind of under control so I don't have to rip things out and try to clean them off sort of thing. So um, generally speaking, it looks like it lasts a couple weeks. And again, that, but that whole bag is for a 75 gallon. So if you have a smaller tank, you could probably open up that bag and put in a smaller amount. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Daniel says, hi, for a low tech, moderately planted tank, is it better to have the lights at a higher intensity for less time or lower light intensity for a longer time? I, low tech, moderately planted tank. I Definitely. think that kind of answers your question. If it's low tech, moderately planted, usually high light intensity is good for high light plants. And certainly when you're kicking in the CO2, mm -hmm. right? When you've got the high tech CO2 sort of thing going on, I would tend to go, with the lower intensity. So for instance, we got some, we've got some Fluval 3.0s from Corey from Aquarium Co-op that we've got on a couple of our 125s. And our bottom 125 really just had Anubias, it had some Java Fern, at one point it had some Crips. And so for that one, I had to turn the intensity down. I think I turned it down to like 65% because I was getting too much algae growth because the lights were a little bit too intense. But on the top 125, the jungle valve really took off. I had a lot more crypts, a lot more Anubias. And if you look at like last year's uh, fish room tour, like the, I don't know, I did like seven parts of that one. I really messed that one up. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it was like, going and going I know, I, like people were like, going. all right, dude, how many parts is this thing going to be? You cover like three tanks in every part. I know, I'm sorry. Um, I'm pretty sure it was part seven. If you look at it from 20, January, 2020, I had that top 125 and it was just covered in jungle valve. So the light intensity there, was a little bit higher uh, just because I had a lot more plants. But generally speaking, I would I would start with the lower intensity and see how the plants are doing. That's just kind of my my way of doing it. Okay, let's, oh, this is a great question. And this is something I forgot to address. Susan, thank you so much for asking it. Uh, should we keep some kind of light on at night? I don't. And believe it or not, I had a, a room light on, but the room light was it was fairly close to a tank that was near the, the ceiling of our basement, of our fish room. And I had that light on because I had some fish breeding. And so I, I guess I have two answers for you. If you have fish that are protecting fry, then I generally leave some kind of a light on, just not in the tank itself, but a room light that's relatively dim, almost like kind of like a moonlight, so that the parents can see anything that's coming towards their fry. Short of that, I don't leave any lights on at night. I let the fish go to bed. And if you, like sometimes, you, you know, those blue and red lights, what's kind of interesting, and again, this is something we talk about in biology, is you've got the light spectrum. And there have been so many studies done that when you get into the, the you know, you've got the IR and then you get into the reds, that will actually do better for plants and photosynthetic organisms. They tend to grow better in the in the in the ends of the light spectrum. So the reds, you get way over here into the the, the violet sort of light, and they tend to grow really well. And so sometimes now that light intensity isn't very good, but it could contribute potentially to algae growth. And so I tend not to leave lights on at night, even if they are dim uh, in the tank. So Anthony, thank you so much. Welcome to prime time partner. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome to the the primetime members. Appreciate it. All right, what else we got? Let's see here. Uh, Dateline Denver. Why is hair algae growing on my hair grass? And how do I get rid of it without tearing out the hair grass? That is a wonderful question. Wow. So That's I don't tough. know the inhabitants of your tank, but the, there are a couple different ways. And in, in this particular case, I would rely on organisms to do that work for me. And again, with the hair grass, I have found that there are some that work potentially fairly well, and that is shrimp, like so like you Neocaridina shrimp. You could look at Florida flagfish, although those tend to be some of the more aggressive types of live bears out there. So you have to make sure that it matches with your tank. But the Florida flagfish are great. Like I said, they, they completely cleaned up a 125. And then you have things like guppies, potentially mollies, although it's not guaranteed that those that those are going to work, but sometimes they will munch on them. And so you're really looking at the the, the, the animal side of things, I think. Mm -hmm. What you got over there? Um, I, I just lost it. Okay, well, you oh, keep... Katie? 
Katie, thank you Welcome. so much. Welcome to the, the Primetime Partner Group. You are part of an exclusive club. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, oh, how about uh, from, from Yanni, how many fish should I keep in my 20-gallon tank to ensure there isn't too much algae? So that is another thing that I probably could have made clearer when we were talking about um, load, bio load. And so, yes, making sure your nitrates are 20 parts per million or less is certainly going to help. But water changes is one way. The other way is you could potentially have lower stocking levels. And so for a 20 long, again, it's a complicated question because it depends on whether or not you have plants. It depends on whether or not you want to add things like snails or shrimp or guppies or something that might help control the algae. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when you're thinking about algae control, I mentioned the floating plants like hornwort, like the guppy grass, like the wisteria and the water sprite. Those tend to have the majority of their growth near the top. And so a lot of times they will block some of the light further down in the tank and that's going to make it a little bit harder for the algae to grow. So I don't have a great, I don't have a number for you. Like have yeah, four fish in your 20 long and you'll be <laughs> fine because what if those fish are like, oh, I've got Jack Dempsey's. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> or, hey, you know what? I decided to get four uh, Florida least killifish, Heteriandra formosa, and they're like, you know, an inch. And you're like, well, you could have put 20 in there and you would have probably not had any algae issues. So it depends on the types of fish you want to keep and whether or not you're going to be putting fish. A mono shrimp, absolutely, are another one that will help with green hair algae. Thank you, James. Uh, they will do... Yeah, that would, that would be a very good addition. Let's see here. What else we got? What else? James has the, gets the hockey game. See ya. Hockey game. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. I guess we can we can deal with that. Uh, let's see, Jonathan. Um, yeah. Oh, Amano shrimp. Yep, oh, I, I just said that. Right, with the Amanos. Yeah. Those, oof, we have them in one tank. They're no, just... those, I don't think those are, I don't think those are all the Amanos. Those were, um. Did we have in ours? No, it was something else. Really? I can't oh. remember what they are, I don't, but I, no. I don't like them. They're the big cute. insect looking things. No. Oh, they're not, right. not cool. Let's see here. Um, Daniel said, adding to Amanda Baker's message, put low light plants in the covered parts of the tank accompanied with some spiderwood and some cerua stone. And you have a masterpiece. Yeah, that ah. would look really cool. Yeah. Hold on. I've got a big question now. Wait, how do we say this? Because I'm afraid. I'm a oh, little. Um, is it Johannes? Johannes. And by Not the way, sure. please, because you're yes. here all the time. And we love us. that you're here. Yes. Um, we do want to make sure that you're saying here. So if you could spell it phonetically for us if we're yeah, messing it up. Be great. Um, and he says, I, hi, I only have blackbeard algae, no other kind. What makes the blackbeard algae thrive so I can do the opposite? Mm. Um, water, nutrients, and light. So take out all the water, turn the lights off, and you'll be fine. No, um, the blackbeard algae is, is definitely, I think, of everything that we talk about, beside the red spot algae, but it grows so stinking slow, it almost doesn't matter. Uh, uh, wait, wait, here we have the, the phonetic spelling. Oh, Juano. Juano? Juano? All right, confirm Close that. enough to, my, to yeah. my name, but yes, confirm that I, I did that correct. Okay, so blackbeard algae yeah, is one of the more difficult things to deal with. We have it in many of our tanks, in fact, but I mean, if you if you just go back to the, the fish room tour that we released on Friday, you will see that it is in our multi 40 gallon breeder. There is some in the 50 gallon low boy. There's some in the electric blue Acara 125. Um, where else do we have it? At least in, oh, the, the uh, Neil Amperlog is similis 20 long. And so it, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a matter of completely eliminating it. I, if, if you want an answer to eliminate it completely, I don't have that answer for you. What I can tell you is it can be controlled to the point where it's really not going to be like completely unsightly or it's like, oh my gosh, well, I like your Blackbeard algae tank. Uh, and that, that <laughs> has always been... Uh, that always starts with the water changes and making sure that we're hitting that target of 20 parts per million of nitrate or less. And then the other part of it too, and I don't remember if you said uh, if your tank was planted or not. If it's not planted, again, controlling the light, the light intensity. And so certainly controlling the amount of light. If you're, if you're finding, hey, you know what? I've got my lights on 12 hours a day. Well, can you shorten that up to 10 hours a day or nine hours a day or eight hours a day? Uh, for us, we try to find a balance when it comes to light. When are we going to be in the fish room? 
we center it around when the fish are going to be feeding and when we're going to be enjoying the fish. So for us, it doesn't for us it doesn't make any sense to keep the lights on all day when we're not down in the fish room except for in the in the morning and then in the evening. And so we want to make sure, at least I want to make sure, my lights are all on timers. They come on well usually at least in the morning, at least an hour before it's time to eat. In the evening, it, it comes on much earlier. And I wanna make sure the lights are on about an hour after I feed them, especially for tanks where I'm feeding live baby brine. I wanna make sure that all the fish have time to eat the food uh, and, and to kind of scavenge and make sure they're cleaning up any uneaten food and, and, and that kind of thing. So you can deal with the light, you can deal with the nutrients. And if you do that, it's probably not going to grow to a point where it's like, yeah, everything is completely covered, right? If you control those two things. Let's see here. Um, this, this is funny. Tasha, hey, Tasha, um, says, I have brown algae in my overstocked Malawi tanks. Hate it. Love green algae. <laughs> Neither love yeah. it or hate it. So, People have their specifics. Yeah, the brown algae in the Malawi tanks we have had good luck with the bristlenose plecos, provided that they have hiding spots in the in the rock work. So it's not something I necessarily would put in. I, I I don't know if I would necessarily put the the bristlenose plecos in a African cichlid tank where there was no place for them to retreat to when the lights are on. But and sometimes when I'm talking about bristlenose plecos and snails, sometimes it takes more than one. All right. So if you've got like let's say a 75 gallon tank that's getting a lot of algae. And you've got a single bristlenose pleco in there that might work, but sometimes it takes three or four. Like I, as an example, I don't know how this happened because these fish have never, we've never had bristlenose plecos breed in our 150, our four foot 150. We never scraped that glass. It mm -hmm. has no live plants. At one point it was really heavily stocked. If you go back and look at yeah. some of the older fish room videos and it's one of the least or the most algae-free tanks that we have. There's almost never algae. And the reason for that is somehow we wound up with, I think the one time I counted, there was like a dozen bristlenose plecos in that tank. I think they were breeding and they were breeding and I, we'd get a few of them like, oh, that one's nice. Just chuck it in the 150 <laughs> and pretty soon. Now we barely ever see them because they're under the rocks and the wood, but they come out at night and they just do their thing and they keep that tank spotless. Now we do put sinking pellets mm -hmm. in there too because we want to make sure they're getting enough food, but we're finding a balance in there that it's working out fairly well. So sometimes it's a matter of like with the Malawi tanks, putting in two or three bristlenose plecos, giving them a place to hide. And again, if it's an established Malawi tank, then you're gonna want bristlenose plecos that are larger. The mistake that some people make is they're like, oh, I heard that bristlenose and Malawis will get along. And then we put in these two and a half inch bristlenose plecos and they go in there and they just get absolutely brutalized by the, by the um, Malawis. So it might take two or three and go that way with it. Uh, better days. Thank you so much for becoming a member. Appreciate Yay, you being here. You're welcome. All right, let's see here. Who want a ra uh, rainbow question? I don't. I'm not really great with rainbows. No. I have some, but I'm not like an expert. Right, you don't want like, a specific question? Okay. I mean, if it's about like breeding or something, my answer is going to be hmm. talk to Lucas. All our brats. No. Okay. No. Um, Regina heard that Madagascar rainbows aren't oh. true rainbow fish. I don't know if that's true. I don't think they are. I think they're a different genus. Uh, we've had yeah. them before. They're they're one of we my don't... favorite rainbows. They were in our yeah. 150. I had a group of them. I love the way they swim. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, for some people with the rainbow fish, they don't necessarily like the big body and then the, the I don't little like tiny the, head. The little head. We don't have a whole lot of them. I like them. Like... Mm -hmm. But the Madagascars are a different shape. And yeah, they're different genus for sure. But they're cool. So hold on, Adam asked a great question. How will low pH or lack of hardness in, an, in water affect plant growth? It depends on how low your pH is. Um, anytime you're in the above six, less than eight and a half, 8.2, most plants are gonna grow in that. So if you're talking really low, you know, like, oh, I've got a pH of four or three or something like that. I'm trying to breed these really awesome South American cichlids. Yeah, that is probably going to be a problem, but plants are fairly resilient to most pHs. Um, water hardness, again, I would say they are not as prone to those issues, maybe even as fish are for the most. And again, part of it depends on the plants, but for most of like your beginner plants, if your water hardness is somewhere, let's uh, five, maybe five degrees 
and up you know up to i mean our 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 water hardness is like 10 to 12 degrees and we've never had issues with with uh with live plants so there's a pretty big range there where they're mm -hmm. going to be mostly okay all right uh, Jared asked, this is a good question too, what's the difference between red spot algae and blackbeard algae? I have a 20 high with blackbeard and after getting the blackbeard in, under control, um, hard to control red spot started to appear on rocks, wood, and plants. Uh, so technically speaking, I believe they are both technically red algae. So they are very similarly re, uh, related. Now uh, they are closely related, I should say. Um, obviously, there's a, a big difference in the way they appear, their hardiness. Like I said, I don't worry of all the algaes that we've talked about. I think the red spot in terms of its its growth tends to be some of the slowest growing algae. And I also find it to be the most appealing. So I, I'm a weird person. I kind of like it. But the downside to the red spot algae is that, first of all, I haven't found it to be toxic to anything. So fish or anything like that. But at the same time, it I have never found anything that will eat it. No. All right. So it, where we have it growing, we've got... We've had shrimp, we've had snails, we've had bristlenose plecos, we've had, I think at one point, Chinese algae eaters in some of these tanks and mollies and all kinds of stuff. And I've never really seen anybody take an interest in it. They just <laughs> kind of leave it alone. So that's kind of stinks, I suppose, but it's okay. This is a funny comment. You want a funny? All right, let's talk no, about I, a funny comment. All right. Cheryl, hey Cheryl. Um, whenever I see some algae near the back of my tank, I think. Jason would think it's okay, so I won't try so hard to get back there. <laughs> See, I'm glad I'm having a, I don't know if it's a positive influence, but I'm having an influence on, on somebody. That's that's good. So, yeah, I I don't worry. Don't worry about it, especially if it's not overgrown or anything. And for people who don't have a planted tank, control what we've already talked about, and it will be, it will be okay. Uh, don't worry. Everything will be fine. Let's see here. Um, Tyler. We're going to get a slightly off subject, and then I promise we'll get right back on subject. Can you provide any care tips for ocelotus? So I'm assuming you are talking about the Lake Tanganyikan shell dweller, like the gold ocelotus, Lampalagus ocelotus. Yep, I would say your best bet is to tread carefully with them in terms of your stocking levels. And so I don't know what size tank you have, but I probably would want at least a 20-gallon. And I think that's usually good enough to be safe for a pair Often, when you breed them, it's beneficial to remove the fry from the tank because, especially if you have more than a pair, because sometimes they will go missing. I know I have friends who, who breed them fairly regularly, and what they do is they tend to wait for the ocelotus to sit by the shell. And if they see any little tiny baby head sticking out of the shell, they just remove the shell, put it in a grow-out tank, feed it live baby brine, and they get a bunch of offspring. I've had decent luck growing up groups in a 20 long where I think I might have had six or seven and they kind of but there was some rock work and lots of shells and they kind of all took their area they can be aggressive towards one another more so than a lot of the other shell dwellers I think at least in terms of shell dwellers the two most aggressive that I've had were the ocelotus and the meleagris and the meleagris by far the even more aggressive than the ocelotus if you're trying to keep them with other fish uh, just be careful that they are not inhabiting the same areas as the ocelotus especially other shell dwellers because they will tend to be much more aggressive than let's say Maltese and Similis. And so mixing them might be tough because once they start protecting fry, they get very aggressive to the point where if you stick your hand in the tank, they will bite you and hmm. you will feel it. They've got little fangs and if you look closely, you'll see them. Yep. Fantastic fish though. Okay, I saw something and I don't remember who asked it. It was about green water. And although technically speaking, most green water is caused by cyanobacteria, which is bacteria, not algae, I thought it was definitely a uh, something we could talk about. And I also want to talk about filig uh, filigree aquatics and hydrogen peroxide. So hold that thought. You're supposed to remember hydrogen peroxide because it's a very it. good thing. I got it. Um, but uh, green water. I actually did an entire video on green water. There are, again, a number of ways that you deal with it. A lot of it is similar to what we've talked about in terms of light, nutrient levels. But I think with green water, the one thing that we can add to this discussion that we haven't talked about, and that is a UV filter. That will tend to do a very good job of clearing the stuff out because the green water, the, the bacteria is in the water column. It's not stuck to a surface. So generally speaking, UV light 
isn't going to do a lot of help with the algae, but it can with the green water. Uh, it's certainly a very effective thing. Uh, yeah, filigree aquatics, prime time aquatics. Corey had, an, had the idea of killing blackbeard algae with peroxide. Totally works, turns red. And yeah, it's that has been something that people have used for, for quite some time. And he's absolutely right. The, the trick there is it's beneficial if you can obviously drain the water and then spot spray the areas where there is blackbeard algae. And it does exactly that. It will turn red and then it will die off. But once again, once you do that, you also then have to address why did the blackbeard algae get there in the first place, and that's going to be addressing your lighting and your nutrient levels. And yeah, but that will definitely do a good job of destroying the blackbeard algae. Okay, let's see here. B picks guitar picks says I have a UV light on my 112 gallon with discus fish. It keeps the water clear, but will it help with the algae on the sides of the bottom eventually? No. Mm. Um, so it will definitely help with anything that's in the water. So that's especially useful if you've got uh, something like, you know, you've got an ick parasite or something that's floating, some kind of a bacterial thing that's that's more impacting fish on their surfaces, you know, on the, on the outside of their body where it could get in the water and potentially get sucked up and die. Green water will definitely help. But in terms of algae, the only, I don't even think it would help with the spores because spores are usually UV resistant. So that is yeah the uv light is is cool it probably won't help you too much with the algae are you looking yeah okay hey, hey james welcome back hey james welcome back uh brian do you guys take vacation uh yeah sometimes <laughs> um it's <laughs> at fishy places <laughs> well aquariums. yeah we we tend to center our our, our vacations these days on what cool things can we see while we're while we're while we are away and generally with that, it does take some planning. And so we, we have to make sure that our tanks are done. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes we don't actually go to see like aquariums. We sometimes go to see fish stores. That's true too. Yeah. So yeah. we like to vary it. Yeah, we definitely want to make sure that we're seeing the sites. Um, yeah, vacations. It's, it's one of those things when you've got a lot of tanks, you have to plan. And yeah. one thing I think people worry about maybe a little too much, and it depends on the type of fish you're keeping, is what do you do about fish feeding? And usually if we're going to be gone less than four days, I don't worry about it. I make sure that they're well fed the, the couple weeks leading up to it. Um, and then maybe feed in the morning. I'll feed out some, after the lights go off. I'll put some like uh, Rapashi Community Plus gel foods in some of the tanks. So it's kind of something for them to snack on that day. And then hopefully they're only getting like maybe three-ish, four days at the most where they're not going to be eating, which is fine. And then we uh, make sure we feed them well when we get back. Mm -hmm. So... Never had a problem doing it. Never really, I don't recall ever coming home and be like, oh, we just lost a bunch of fish. So, yeah. Okay, what else we got here? Noel, sitting watching my new group of Amano munch on blackbeard algae mm. in my newly aquascaped Anubias on wood, oh. a la Joanna's oh, green oh, wire yay. technique in Guppyville. Small <laughs> scape prime time tips in action. You guys are the best. Oh, Thank yay. you so much. Glad you are enjoying the tank. Yep, a mono shrimp are a Anubius. great thing to add to control that algae. Yippee. All right. Hmm. Let's see here. Tommy G. Those hair algae prefer to grow on specific surfaces. I have a moderately heavily planted tank, and the hair algae only seems to grow on my plant leaves. Nowhere else. Not on spiderwood or on glass? Um, that's a good question. So I have found that it's not particularly picky for us. Once it has the, once it, it, it adheres to a surface, it will basically grow there. So I have found, yes, it absolutely loves to grow on leaves. Uh, for us, like especially in our gymnogeophagus tank, you'll see it on the wood. In fact, Luke, that is the one thing he does have to do when he cleans that tank is he has to go through and pull all the green hair algae off the wood. Off the glass, it grows on the glass in our 50 gallon low boy. And interestingly enough, it really doesn't grow anywhere else. So it just depends on where it decides to attach. And eventually, if you if you let it go, like if you were to just be like, let me just see where this green hair algae is going to go. If you leave the lights on and like say, okay, I'm not gonna do water changes for a few weeks and just let nature take its course, it will grow everywhere. It will eventually Give it okay. time, and it will it will overtake your tank, mm -hmm. and it'll be like, ha ha ha! I'm green hair algae. Mm -hmm. You thought I was tame, and I was only going to grow on your plants. Watch this! Mm -mm. Yikes, Sora! Mm -hmm. For some reason, my ammonia on my rescape tank has been at 
0.25 parts per million for the last three days. We did water changes. We've been using a use filter and added Fritzheim 7. Huh, we we're doing all the right things. Um, I don't know if I have a lot of advice other than to continue what you're doing. Uh, 0.25 parts per million is not earth shattering. The one thing I will tell you is you want to look at a few things. Uh, one, I would look at just make sure there's no ammonia in your tap. Uh, two, you can use most dechlorinators will also, a lot of, not most, but many dechlorinators will have some type of ammonia neutralizing substance that will prolong the issue, but it will also uh, take care of that, at least temporarily. Uh, you've got the Fritzheim 7, so I would keep adding that as directed because that's got your live beneficial bacteria. You've got the use filter media. So, you know, you reskate the tank. So chances are, if you did that, you probably have maybe different plants, different wood, certainly different substrate. And so now we're just relying specifically on the media to deal with that ammonia. And it will take, it'll take a little while to adjust. The other thing is I did a video a while back on, there's two different types of ammonia. There is what's called total ammonia nitrogen, TAN, and then there's something called unionized ammonia, UIA. It's that second type, the unionized ammonia that is harmful to your fish. Unfortunately, all of our, well, almost all test kits are measuring total ammonia nitrogen, which is dependent upon temperature, and it's also dependent upon pH. So if you were to go in and watch that video, I think it's called something like why your ammonia test kit has been lying to you. <laughs> There's a calculator there where you can add you can you can add in your pH you can add in your water temperature and see if that ammonia is actually reaching a critical level to your livestock and if nothing more if it's not you can relax a little and be like okay I'm gonna let nature take its course and everything's gonna be okay Finn Wiggles thank you so much for the thank super you. chat sorry I'm late hey, welcome glad you're here glad you're here <laughs> such a uh, great name it is Finn Wiggles oh <laughs> right, wait are you done I'm done all right, all right. James. Still waiting on that Anubias shirt on the small scape. Well, well. Oh, it's yeah. coming. There might be another one that like jumps ahead of it. I, get, I just get this feeling it's going to be an Anubias shirt, but she's going to put like Nana Petite on there, and it's going to be like this one little thing, and it's like a little speck, <laughs> right? Like you're no. ultra small, and you're like, I would be tempted, but what is this? It's just a black shirt with a white speck on it. No, look, <laughs> look, look at what I did. There's Anubias. <laughs> yep. Uh, Nikki Addison, I'm getting ready to make the switch from for my tank from an aqua clear hang on back to an aquarium co-op sponge filter any tips for the first time sponge filter user mm. well um any tips so first thing and i think this could be potentially helpful one you're in an established tank and so all of your surfaces already have beneficial bacteria most likely so the risk of having an ammonia spike is greatly reduced but one of the things i do is i will usually with the AquaClear, if you've got some filter floss in there or even a little piece of sponge, if you look at my very early videos, what you will notice is there will be a piece of filter floss jammed in between the sponge filter and the glass of the tank. And the reason I did that is because all of that beneficial bacteria on that filter floss came from an existing tank and that was helping seat the, the sponge. So that is something to consider. The other thing, in addition to that, is I would let that AquaClear continue to run for at least three or four weeks just to make sure that sponge sponge filter has enough beneficial bacteria to make sure you don't have any issues. And so often, uh, that's what I will recommend for people. People ask all the time, hey, I'm getting ready to switch filters. How long will it take before my new filter has the beneficial bacteria to deal with all of the issues, you know, the, the nitrogen cycle? And for us, just to be safe, I like to wait about four weeks before I will completely switch over to the new filter. Unless you're just swapping the filter media over completely, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, uh, Irene's here. Irene. Hey, Irene. Fellow scientist. <laughs> How are know. you? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Science is everywhere. <laughs> um, and um, Mary Page brought up a good point. She did. Everybody was great. Great group that we had. We always have great groups that's here. That's awesome. We have awesome people I'm here. I'm glad that Yay. we had a great group today. Uh, Finn Wiggle says the small scape was inspired today. So, oh, yay. yeah, the video I was, I was mentioning, the video that you did about the all the plants that, uh, oh, plants, that plants, you can plants. get. So you can check that out yeah. if you feel so inclined. Mm -hmm. uh oh, Ryan said green hair algae everywhere, brown algae on the glass, and now this brown fuzzy stuff 
on my Nightmare. Choya wood has taken over my tank. Should mm -hmm. I use chemicals like Flourish Excel or deploy the Odos <laughs> and the Monos? That's a great visual. So, yeah, it sounds like you've got a tank that is still in flux, right? Shark it's just it's kind of settling in. Um, so the brown algae is probably the easiest to deal with. The brown fuzzy stuff is probably mm. most likely the dreaded black beard algae. And, of course, you've got the green hair algae. So you could uh, go the, in this case, if you've got, a, so first of all, we want to make sure that your tank is cycled, right? So a lot of times when you get all of these different kinds of algae at first, it's because we're still dealing with ammonia. We might still be, uh, be dealing with nitrite. And so sometimes that can throw a tank into disarray. So as long as your water parameters are okay, could you use those other things to help get a foothold on the algae? Yes, but don't ignore the, the water change side of things because here's what's going to happen, especially if you use something like the Flourish Excel or you use the, um, the, the Fritz uh, type stuff where the you know, algae fix. When you do that, and when you start to kill off that algae, that is in itself going to release organics into your water column that you're going to have to remove. So a lot of times what will happen is people use these products and they initially destroy the algae, but then if you don't do the water changes to get out all of that now dead stuff, it's just going to decay and be a food source for new algae. And then once you do that, you can certainly deploy all your, your army of algae eating things to keep everything in line. Or maybe sharks with freaking laser beams. That would be cool. Yes, sharks with laser beams. Daniel says, are all Lampralogus fish shell dwellers? Uh, no, they are not all shell dwellers. Sometimes there are rock dwelling Lampralogus as well. Okay, let's see here. We're going to probably take, because we're getting long on time, and this is a great party, and I love that we're all having a, a good time here. Hopefully you are too. Uh, we'll take a few more questions, and then we are going to let you get to your evening. Uh, Matthew's got a question about CO2. I am the last person you'd want, but let's says I have staghorn algae, mm -hmm. uh, Fluval 3.0 running nine hours, uh, 12 mm -hmm. degrees, um, carbonate hardness, CO2 injected, and Thrive S fertilizer to 10 parts per million nitrates. Weekly water changes. What else can I do? So. I'm not as good with the CO2 stuff. There's an element there, and I'm just, you know, I don't want to give advice for something that I don't, there's an element there that I don't quite grasp as easily because I don't run CO2. And so that is something that's a little bit beyond where I feel comfortable. It's like, oh yeah, you just turn the CO2 up or you turn it down and you fix this light. So the CO2 thing is, is, the, is a big factor in that. And since I don't run CO2, I probably wouldn't be a great person to answer that question. So maybe there's someone else in the chat that's like a CO2 just awesome person who knows all about that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. Do you, do you want a Jim No Geophagus question? I love Jim No Geophagus <gasps> questions. Yes, they're interesting. Okay, Keith, heard you mentioned Jim No Geophagus. Do mm -hmm. all Jim Nos need cool periods or are there any that will thrive in year round temps of 72 or above? I live in Louisiana. Yay, so Louisiana. I think yeah. all of them would wouldn't mind those cooler those cooling off periods in fact it was something that i considered it it's stuff, stuff that sometimes i don't actually discuss in the videos and i probably should do a better job of this when i'm doing fish room tours and stuff but our 75 gallon where i have our gymno geophagus is right smack dab in front of our basement window and there is a little bit of a draft there it's not drastic but that tank will actually fluctuate when the heat is on yes it will get up into the the probably the upper 70s and stay there and then once that heat goes off in the spring and in the fall in between the time where the heat's off and I don't have the dehumidifier fully running that tank does drop to around 72 73 and so it really worked out perfectly are there gymnos that can deal with mid yeah so the short answer is I, I think so like the gymno geophagus uh, balzani that I have I don't think I'd have much of a, a an issue if I were keeping them at 76 77 somewhere in there year round Will they breed for me? Probably not if I do that. Will they live as long? Nah, I think it'll get pretty close, all right? Okay, let's see here. Let's take a few more, a few more questions. Uh, the Midnight Lobster asks, is it harder to grow algae in acidic water? It depends on how acidic. So 
When we're dealing with acidic water, usually we're talking about anything less than seven, right? So seven is neutral. If we're talking about a pH of three or four, yeah. If we're talking about a pH of around six to a six and a half, I don't think it's gonna make a lot of difference compared to like neutral or slightly above. All right, let's see here. Uh, Amanda Baker asks, any no-go rooms in the house for aquariums? If you're talking about our mm. house, mm. as of right now, the answer is yes, but it fluctuates like every other day. There's really only two rooms that don't have, well, three. The boys' room, they don't have one right now. The in small which bathroom know. doesn't have one because it's small. And the living room. And the living room, which yeah. I have I've actually put my foot down a number of times. Well, and I put my foot down a number of we times, alternate, too. We alternate. Yeah, you know, we alternate. So we get these all, moments of weakness. All, all it takes yeah. will be one moment when we both say, it's going to monster tank in the living room. Yeah, and then it's going to, and once and we've <laughs> committed, it's going to happen. Like, nope, now everything. But, but usually but, all four of us will say, yeah, I'm not cleaning it, though. That's the problem. The boys instantly, whenever they hear a new tank, like, <laughs> I'm not adding that to my my list of tanks to do. And I'm like, well, I don't know, really know if I want to take care of it. And Joanna's like, yeah. well, I've already got the nano wall. I'm like, all right, let's not add any yeah, more tanks to the living right room. Now. But the, the problem is, and I think where th we could have a moment of weakness is we have one wall and we just kind of rearranged our furniture in our living room. We have one wall and that wall is probably about seven to eight feet long. And it really would look cool if I had a custom built like seven or eight foot aquarium yeah, right in that space. And that's, as long as we don't have a moment of weakness. That's so funny. Yeah. You have no concept of space. It's like like 10 to 12 feet long. I don't know. So you could well, really Don't tell tank. me that because now it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, Noelle said, we need another cool, not cool video with your boys. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I forgot fun. about that video. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, we're going to have to think of... Uh, We'll have to get Luke to do it too. Luke's a little bit more, and it's funny because when I first started the channel, Luke was the one who was kind of with me, and then he was like, "Nah, I don't want to be in the videos." Yeah. I'm like, "I'm not gonna force my kids to be in a video. That'd be some kind of weird child abuse sort of thing." But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll have to do that again. Uh, let's see here. One more question. How about that? Do we have a good one? Uh, oh, here's a good one. Hmm. Just popped right up. Well, maybe we two. Uh, Orphan Slayer seventy seven. Can you keep different Earth Eaters together? Uh, it depends on the size of the tank. So if you've got a really large tank, like let's say uh, 125, a six foot tank or larger, yeah, you might be able to do like Geophagus Tapajos and Geophagus Wine Milleri and, and mix a few together. The issue you're gonna have, of course, is hybridization. And so there's a high likelihood, especially when you're dealing with Wine Milleri and Altafrons and um, uh, what's the other one? Cernamensis, where they look really similar you wind up with some hybridization. And that, that can be a little rough because I know for the geophagus, it's really nice when you have those as those pure strains. But in terms of the aggression levels, they will be there. I mean, you, you will have a dominant something and it will probably go ahead and assert its dominance over any of, you know, all the different types of geophagus that you have in the tank. So I personally don't mix them because I, I really, really, really don't want hybridization. And again, with a, with a larger group, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable because they get pretty big, right? A lot of these earth eaters can get eight, nine, 10 inches. Uh, the males can. And so I want them to be in a, in a tank where that would be large enough, like a six foot or an eight foot tank if I was going to mix them. But I probably wouldn't. That's just me though. Um, Daniel asks, can I use coconut based substrate in an aquarium? If so, which is better, coconut or what is this? Coconut or oh, I lost it. Oh, sphagnum. Sphagnum, sphagnum uh, moss. moss based substrate. Um, as a substrate, I um, I I don't know if I would do that. And I think the reason why is not so that stuff sometimes coconut. I mean, people put coconut shells in their tank like for epistogramma and stuff like that. But to put put it in as a substrate i probably wouldn't do that uh, just because i think you would be adding a lot of organics that would eventually break down and while it, at least initially it might not be a huge deal i think over time it would lead to all kinds of water quality issues in the terrestrial world both of those could be very yeah good, yeah i just don't think i would i would yeah. throw them in a tank bonnie thank you so much i'm glad you're here Hi, thank bonnie, you for the super you. chat appreciate it let's see here all righty let's do okay 
Last question. Garrett asks, I have a 75 gallon tank that's highly planted. Two Asta 120s, okay, and two canister filters with CO2. Was wanting some stocking ideas for a heavily planted 120, huh? Mm. Well, I, I know what I would do with the 75 gallon. You can you can expand on this if you want, because I think I know what you would say. Jeez. For me, if I had a heavily planted 120, I think I would want a group of a pistogram of penduro. I'm just I'm just shooting off the hip here. Uh, a group of a pistogram of penduro, mm -hmm. like maybe ten of them, and then I would want like a group of von Rio tetras because I really like them. I love their color, and so maybe I would do like fifteen of those, and I would probably also add in a group of orange laser cory cats, like maybe mm. six or eight of those, and possibly a really cool pleckle that wow. you would almost never see, but when you do, it'd be the coolest thing in the world, wow. right? Like a zebra pleco or something like as, as a really little awesome surprise for people like, hey, come here, come look. You can see the tail of my zebra pleco sticking out. It's the first time I've seen oh, him in six yeah. months, right? What would you do? What about a, a big ginormous school of green neons? That's, how, how many of you knew that's what she was going to say, right? right? Yeah. Some rams maybe? Rams would be cool, and especially... That was the other thing I was thinking too, is like the, the yellow rams. Mm. Uh, they're gold rams, but those yeah. are really cool as well. So I could definitely sure. do a group Sign of those. Me up. Yep. All right, everybody. So I think, I hope that you found the algae discussion useful. I hope it was something that you can think about. And like I said, when it comes to algae, it's not any one thing, it's trying to do all the things in combination. So, yeah. And, uh, look for i hopefully you look forward to we got fish room tour part two coming up like i said on friday so hopefully you will enjoy that part two and of two part two of yes part two of two just to be clear <laughs> um so yeah we're not going to no break it up into 50 million parts so part two is the last in total part but mm -hmm. yes thank you so much and hopefully we will see you here next wednesday as well at yeah eight o'clock central standard Yippee. time and I hope you all have a good evening. And thank you to everyone again for the super chats and for Middle and Mary Page for all the work that you did. Thank and you. for everybody asking the awesome questions. We will see you next week.